One of the great things that the Book of Mormon does is open the meaning of the Bible in more than one way. And tonight we want to discuss one of the real challenging, in some ways, one of the real challenging ways in which this does. But I'm going to rely on the statement of the Prophet Joseph Smith as we talk about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the plainest book God ever caused to be written. I put my hand on the sacred scriptures, I raise my hand to the square, and I bear you my testimony. That is a true statement. Now, many of you <coughs> may want to believe, <coughs> but still may not. But I hope in some measure we can open some doors. And if there's credit for that, <coughs> it comes from the Book of Mormon, from the Prophet Joseph Smith, and uh, from the Lord in his help, which I freely and humbly acknowledge. Let me, in order to approach this subject, get back and get the foundation. Some of you people haven't uh, been here prior to this, and so I need then to go back to 1 Nephi 14. <coughs> and on the basis then of 1 Nephi 14, we have foundation to understand the book of Revelation. And I want you to get that in your mind, open your hearts and your souls, because that verily is true. Now, in 1 Nephi 14, <coughs> Nephi sees these two great churches, the church of the mother of abominations, which is the whore of all the earth, and then he sees the church of the Lamb of God, and that church of the Lamb is though constitutes those Latter-day Saints who come up in adversity, purify their lives, and realize the blessings that Nephi talks about when he said, uh, I beheld that the uh, saints were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now, that's the church of the Lamb, the spiritually endowed church. So he sees then that these two churches exist, and this, this brings it down to our time, because there's never a period in this dispensation when you have a situation where the church of the Lord, the true church of Jesus Christ, is planted in all the major nations of the Gentiles. You don't have that, and you haven't had that until post-World War II days when with the administration of President McKay, we began to be an international organization. And so this prophecy focuses then on our time and on future events from our time. And Nephi sees then that the mother of abominations gathered multitudes from among the Gentiles primarily to fight against God. And it came to pass that Nephi then said when this took place, as he saw all these churches throughout the world built up these stakes and these wards, that he then said, I beheld the power of God, that it descended upon the saints to the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord. And this has particular reference to the converted Jews who will one day receive it and flee to Jerusalem. Uh, not that all Jews will be converted, but there will be those who do. And the major nation of, of the Jews will not. But then he says that the power of God in great glory uh, rests upon them, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God. And then he sees the preparatory work that the Lord does to establish Zion, and that preparatory work is a cleansing work, and that cleansing work is a work of cleansing among the Latter-day Saints and of this land of Zion. And so. He sees then, when the power of God rests upon the saints, then that there will be wars and rumors of wars among all nations, and this includes our beloved America. And he says, now, when the day cometh, verse 17, that uh, wrath of God is poured out upon uh, the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth and so forth, whose foundation is the devil. Then at that day, that's a point of reference, that's telling us a time and what will happen. Then at that day, 
the work of the Father should commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are the house of Israel. Now this is not the day of Israel's gathering, of Israel's redemption. Note, he says this is the day when the Father shall commence in preparing the way. This is a preparatory situation and action, and it's, and it's carried out in connection with this warfare that's poured out upon all nations. The preparatory program is one that is fulfilled through warfare. That's what he's saying. And it's going to be preparatory then to the work of preparing, of, of, uh, of fulfilling his covenants which he has made to his people who are the house of Israel. Now there are two things that are necessary primarily to prepare. One is we need a Zion people. We need people then who are truly Zion in the sense that they become sanctified, that they are truly a consecrated people, that they live in tune with the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit brings them to a free and open union where they see eye to eye, as the prophet says they will do when he brings again Zion. See, Now that kind of preparation will take judgment. As Isaiah says in chapter 1 of Isaiah, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. Now that's the key then. Now the other part of the preparation is the cleansing of this land. Now that preparation can take place either of one or two ways. It can take place by the repentance of the Gentiles, and they're embracing the gospel and freely building up the new Jerusalem. But if this doesn't happen, then when the Gentiles turn into iniquity and the cup of iniquity is full, then the Lord indicates, as he has said in his great promise of this land, that this is the, the land of Zion and that it will be a free people as long as you serve the God of the land who is Jesus Christ. But if we don't, then when they are ripe in iniquity, they will be swept off the land. That has happened twice, at least actually three times. The antediluvian people were swept off in the flood and the Garden of Eden was here, the Jaredites were swept off, and the Nephites were swept off. And it's going to happen again unless we have a totally reverse situation from what we got going in the country today, see. Now that preparation then is to prepare for the gathering and the fulfilling of the Lord's covenants. And the gathering is the gathering of Israel to America. And the fulfilling of his covenants is bringing his people to Christ and to the Zion order and to the sacred endowments of the Spirit, to the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, so that Zion truly becomes Mount Zion. That's what the gathering, that's what the redemption of Israel is all about. It's not getting their bodies physically from one place to another. Now, in order to, to prepare then for that great gathering, you've got to have a cleansing of this land because this is the land of Zion. And then you've got to have a refinement of the people of the Lord, because they are they who are foreappointed, the doctrine of election, to build Zion. And Zion is going to be built with judgment and her converts with righteousness. And not just to cleanse out the inactive, but to refine and purify the faithful so that their souls, through faith, through diligence, through challenge, through opposition, through adversity, will expand their reliance on the Lord who be perfected, and when they come out from the other end of the tunnel, they will be a righteous remnant ready now to establish the new Jerusalem, and then to the new Jerusalem, endowed with glory and power, the great gathering of Israel will take place. Now when Nephi sees that great scenario, then he is also shown that there is a special apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who was foreordained to write about these events. These events in the cleansing of Zion, these events in the cleansing not just of America now, but the cleansing of the whole earth. And so the book of Revelation then is a book explaining the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of the whole earth and the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth for the millennial reign. Now, how much more important can a book be than one that deals with those subjects, see? And so Nephi then sees this apostle of the Lamb, 
And he says concerning him, the angel says concerning him, Behold, he shall see and write the remainder of these things. And then he clarifies that a little later in the statement, indicating that Nephi saw the same thing that John the Revelator saw, and that Nephi, while he was not permitted to write it, nevertheless saw the full vision which John would see, and that was a point of future for him in his time. And Nephi then writes in a measure the introduction, the preface. If you want to study the book of Revelation, where do you start? You start with 1 Nephi 14. Why? Because that introduces the thing and gives the orientation. And in that sense, then, we're dealing then with, with uh, uh, an inspired commentary and an inspired introduction to a heretofore very difficult to understand book that's been interpreted in about every different way that is humanly possible by uh, people from the beginning of the Christian era to the present time. And the key to the correct knowledge of that book now is in this sacred volume, the Book of Mormon. Now, with that as introduction, let me then turn to uh, the uh, Book of Revelation, and let's see if we can meet uh, the challenge of analysis and uh, get focused in on this particular volume and see what it means. First of all, John gives to, and I'm going to skip the first three verse, uh, the first three chapters. They deal with the seven churches in Asia Minor. They're very important, particularly the promises that are given to the faithful. Uh, but for want of time, I think it would be best if we just say, hey, they deal with the churches of that day and pass those first three chapters on by. And then we come to chapter 4, where you get right into the beginning now of the prophetic picture. And the first thing John sees, in, uh, as expressed now in chapter 4, one of the first, is the great goal and objective for the creation of this earth. He says, for example, in chapter 4, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. Now he sees then this sea of glass, like unto crystal. Let me have you turn to the 15th chapter now, verse 2, where he comes back to this same subject, and he says this in chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over his number, uh, the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now the prophet Joseph comes to our rescue on that one in section 100 and, uh, 30 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and uh, he tells us a few things about celestial life. He says, for example, uh, this earth in its sanctified and immortal state, verse 9, will be a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon, whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of a lower order will be manifested to those who dwell on it, and this earth will be Christ. Now, with that in mind, let's turn to section 77, and maybe you can put uh, your thumb in section 77 for a while because we want to come back to it for a few clarifications. Uh, section 77 is an interesting revelation. It's a series of questions and answers, and they all pertain to the book of Revelation. And in this particular uh, question and answer series, the prophet then deals with this subject of the, uh, uh, of the sea of glass and indicates uh, what it is. Verse 1 of section 77, what is the sea of glass spoken of by John 4, chapter and 6th verse of the Revelation? 
An answer, it is the earth in its sanctified, immortal, and eternal state. So what does John see first of all? He sees the great objective for which the Lord uh, created this earth, the end purpose, and that is that the design now in pouring out the judgments that John sees and in doing the other things that John sees, the great design finally is ultimately to produce a celestialized earth. That's what he sees. And that celestialized earth is an orb likened to crystal mingled with fire, and that has reference to its glory, and it will be so infused with intelligence or the, the glory of God, and keep in mind that section 93 tells us, verse 36, the glory of God is intelligence, and you infuse that material of this earth with, with the intelligence or glory of God, and it becomes a Urim and Thummim, and it becomes a revelatory instrument so that you can look into it and uh, see things pertaining to an equivalent or, or a lower order of glory, see. And uh, this earth then will be Christ, and those who are celestial will dwell on it, and they will have that means then of uh, acquiring knowledge and understanding, and then they'll each have their own pocket-sized Urim and Thummim, as the Lord uh, of the Prophet points out in section 130, whereby things pertaining to a higher order of celestial orbs can be made manifest to each of those. And on that Urim and Thummim that they have will be a new name that no man knows, and so forth, see. All right, so according to the Prophet Joseph Smith's clarification, then, we're starting in the book of Revelation a great cosmic picture dealing with this earth. And that great cosmic picture then uh, commences opening up then with the goal and the objective that this earth then is to be sanctified and is to become a millennium. And then after the millennium, as John sees in chapter 20, then, then you'll have the final great battle of Gog and Magog, there being two such battles, one before the millennium and one after. And then he sees the new heaven and the new earth, and this then is the celestial state, and this is Revelation 21 and 22. And so the book of Revelation then is a great revelatory work concerning this earth and its ultimate destiny. And that's the main theme now that we want to follow. All right, now another thing that we need to understand. Let's, for example, before we get to that though, talk about these four beasts and uh, some details now here in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. Here, for example, in the fourth part of this chapter, and I'm just going to abbreviate, John sees, John sees the throne of God. And then in verse 4 he says, Round about the throne were four and twenty elders, four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And then he goes on to say that he also sees then four beasts. We're down here, for example, uh, in verse 6, the latter part of it, in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was likened to a lion. He goes on and describes them. Now let's turn to section 77 again. Let's pick up the prophet's clarification on this subject. In section 77, the question is asked now, uh, verse 2, what are we to understand by the four beasts spoken in the same verse? And then he answers and he says, now they are figurative expressions used by the revelator John in describing heaven the paradise of God, the happiness of man, and of beasts, and of creeping things, and of the fowls of the air, that which is spiritual, being in the likeness of that which is temporal, and that which is temporal in the likeness of that which is spiritual, the spirit of man in the likeness of his person, also the spirit of beasts in the likeness uh, of their organized beings, see, and every creature which God hath created. Now, the question then is asked, are the four beasts limited to individual beasts, or are they representative of classes and orders? 
and he says they are limited to four individual beasts which were to which were shown to John to represent the glory of the classes of beings in their destined order or sphere of creation and the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. The prophet Joseph Smith once took up this subject of the book of Revelation in comparison with the uh, book of Daniel. Daniel talks about figures of beasts, and there's the four great figures of beasts. And the prophet made it very clear that there's a difference between Daniel's use of beasts and John's use of beasts. Daniel uses the term figure of a beast, which is actually a representative thing, and it applies to beastly kingdoms here on the earth, which are degenerate and which then are vicious in their basic spirit, see. And in that sense, then, those four beasts represent the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian, the greco Macedonian, the Roman, and so forth, see. And those are the four beasts. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, when it comes to the book of Revelation, John sees actual animals in the paradise of God. He sees actual animals there. Now, these animals are made figurative in the sense that there are things portrayed about them which depict some of the nature that they have. Uh, the Revelation says, for example, that the four beasts were, uh, were full of eyes before and behind. Now, the eyes are symbolic of light, intelligence, and that kind of thing. And the wings symbolic of the power to move and to act. And so while they're individual animals, they are figuratively portrayed to symbolize their nature. But we're talking about different creatures. Now, for example, here's the prophet Joseph Smith's statement. He says, I, saw, I suppose John saw beings there of a thousand forms that had been saved from 10,000 times 10,000 earths. Now, John sees the whole vision of the creations of Christ, and he sees the animal kingdom, and that's just simple. And in that animal kingdom on the worlds which Christ has created and redeems, John then apparently saw uh, 10,000 times 10,000 uh, uh, beasts sent from 10,000, 10,000 earths. He's a strange beast of which we have no conception. All might be seen in heaven. The grand secret, and keep this now as the central point, the grand secret was to show John what there was in heaven. I've always said, if there's not a cow there, I don't want to go there. I love milk that much. <laughs> and I've got a good old mutt friend or two that I've had in life that were just as near and dear to my heart as a member of the family. And I hope I have that continued relationship in the resurrection, you see. And that's what Joseph is saying. The grand secret was to show John that there, what there was in heaven. John learned that God glorified himself by saving all that his hands had made. Whether beasts, fowls, fishes, or men, he will glorify himself in them. Now. Realizing this, that there's a resurrection of animals, realizing that God is going to save everything that he creates and glorify it, he's going to do that, and that's his committed program, then John sees four great animals. And the prophet talks about those four great animals, and they represent the order of the animal kingdom in the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. Now, the prophet says this as he speaks of them. He says, God who made the beast could understand every language spoken by them. The four beasts were four of the most noble animals that had filled the measure of their creation and had been saved from other worlds, other worlds than this one. And that raises some interesting things that I don't have time to get to. He says, because they were perfect, they were like angels in their sphere. We are not told where they came from, that is, which world. And he says, and I do not know, but they were seen and heard by John. 
praising and glorifying God. All right, now John then begins by seeing the throne of God. And around the throne of God he sees four and twenty elders. And the prophet clarifies that those four and twenty elders were actual persons. They had been saved from the seven churches that are spoken of in the first three chapters of Revelation. And they're made representative of all saved beings in the human family. And then he sees these four beasts, and they are made representative. And he sees the celestial earth, the glorified earth, like unto a sea of glass and fire. And this then typifies the celestial order of the future. Now can you begin to see what the meaning of John's revelation is all about? All right, now as he sees these, he sees, say, verse 9, and when the those beasts, uh, uh, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne who liveth forever and ever. See, now these aren't beastly systems like Daniel sees, which are beastly and make war against the kingdom of God. These are actual animals in the paradise of God that represent the creative processes as they pertain to the animal kingdom. And the twenty and four elders then represent the faithful saints who will be redeemed and the blessings given to them. All right, now as John then sees these things, then in verse 5 he sees a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel, he says, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book. And he says, I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, one of these four and twenty elders, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and that's just another name for the Messiah or for Christ, the Root of Jesse, that's just another name for Christ in relation to his lineage in the flesh, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And uh, in that sense, then, the book is sealed with seven seals, and Christ then prevails and is worthy to open it. Now let's turn, for example, again back to section 77 and get the prophet's clarification on the subject before we move on. As he speaks on this subject, he says this. Uh, uh, let's go here to uh, verse uh, 6. What are we to understand by the book which John saw, which was sealed on the back with seven seals? We are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the seven thousand years of its continuance or its temporal existence. Now, the temporal existence began with the fall. The word temporal comes from the word temporary. And the temporal existence of the earth then begins uh, with the fall of Adam and Eve. Now we ask then, verse 7, what are we to understand by the seven seals with which it was sealed? And the prophet answers, we are to understand that the first seal contains the things of the first thousand years, and the second also, uh, the second thousand years, and so on to the seventh. He says, what are to understand by the four angels spoken of in the seventh chapter? We'll get to that one. Getting ahead of myself here just a minute. All right, now the book then is sealed on the back with seven seals. Its content, its content then is a revelatory record of all that has gone on on this earth from the fall of Adam down through time. And each seal then the contents under each seal or within the book sealed by a given seal, the contents then deal with that particular 1,000-year period of time. Is that clear? All right, now, uh, 
Let's just say a word or two of clarification that's very important at this point in relation to that book and its seals. Sometimes people get the idea that uh, uh, those seals are opened at the beginning of each thousand years. Now, that's not true. Uh, and in that sense, then, they're sealed and they're all opened, uh, not in the thousand years where the events transpire, but they're opened in the latter days. They're opened in the latter days in such a way that when you finally get to the seventh seal and it's opened, that begins the year, the, the seventh thousand year from the time Adam fell down through then to the opening of that seal. And the six, first six seals are open preliminary to that, and, this, and they then are all within the sixth seal leading up to the opening of the seventh, and the seventh seal is on target. It's right there at the opening of the seventh, uh, of the 7,000 year period. We got that? All right, now there is uh, another feature to this that we need to, to see. And uh, this other feature then relates to the opening of these seals. In John chapter, Revelation chapter 6, we see the opening of those seals, or the, the opening at least of the first six of those seals. And with the opening of those, the first six of those seals, then we see things portrayed in this chapter. When the first seal is opened, he sees a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When the second seal was opened, he writes, and there uh, I heard the second beast say, and keep in mind now, these animals, and they're from other worlds, are involved now in this great process. And so the second beast is heard to say, uh, come and see. And there went up out a red, uh, another horse that was red, and power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword." Now, this beast is a tremendous military system, and power is given to take peace from the earth. Now, when the third seal was open, he says, uh, I heard the third beast say, <clears throat> Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances, you know, these balances that deals with, with the desire for justice and equity, social justice, liberty, etc., uh, had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, those who are represented then by uh, the black horse are interested in, in justice, social justice, equity, and in survival and uh, the necessities or the substances of life, okay? Now, he says, and then he had opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed after him, and power was given him unto him over a fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And then he sees the fifth seal, and when he had heard then that he saw it open, he says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwelleth on the earth? And white robes were given to them, symbolizing blessings, endowments, elevation in their status. White robes were given to them. 
And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, let, let all the martyrs get taken care of, and then the Lord will come out in his judgment See, Meantime, he uh, pacified them, if you want to use that term, it's a little more than that. They were given white robes symbolizing the glory and the power and the things that came to them. And then he says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and I'm going to turn here to the inspired revision of the prophet Joseph Smith, who dealt with this, in order to get you the more complete and accurate picture from the standpoint of Latter-day uh, Revelation. Uh, in relation now to the, to the uh, sixth seal then, beginning here, verse uh, uh, 12, he has this to say. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a, with a mighty wind. And the heavens were opened, as a scroll is opened, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right, the sixth day then is the ordination, and I use that word meaningfully, not the fulfillment, the ordination of the second coming. Okay? Now let's go back and see if we can pick up the picture on this. Some people maintain that uh, these various figures associated with the opening of the seals represent actions and activities in the respective thousand-year period, so that the white horse and he that sat upon the white horse with the bow represent something that took place between the fall of Adam and one thousand of the year of the world. And the red horse represents something that took place between one thousand of the year of the world and the year 2000, which would include the flood, which took place somewhere around 1635 or so after Adam's, Adam's fall, see. And then so on down. Now let me give you, and this is a rather popular clarification. This, however, disregards the clarification given by the prophet Joseph Smith. Now let me turn to his statement and let's see what he says about it. He's the person who called it the plainest book God ever caused to be written. He's the person like John the Revelator saw what John saw, and like the brother of Jared saw what the brother of Jared saw. And hence then, I think, may be qualified to make a clarification that's meaningful. Here in the teachings, page 290, he says this, John saw beasts that uh, had to do with, with things of the earth but not in past ages. Okay? The beast which John saw had to devour the inhabitants of the earth in days to come, future from John. And then he quotes, the prophet does, the book of Revelation, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering unto conquer. Now is this in the first millennial period of this earth's temporal state, or is it after John the Revelator's time, according to Joseph Smith? He makes it very clear, does he not? And then he goes on, and there went out another horse that was red. And power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, 
and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And then he says, now the book of Revelation is one of the plainest books God's ever caused to be written, and that's where the statement comes in. All right, so these things that happened when the seals were opened, when the first seal was opened and the white horse went forth, it has nothing directly to do with 1,000 years from Adam's fall to the, the first millennial period. It is that which is depicted when that seal is opened. And in that sense, then, the opening of the seals are made to reveal the sequence of events in the last days. I don't know whether you've picked that one up, but that's one of the best statements I've made all day long. The opening of the seals is made to reveal the sequence of events in the last days. All right, uh, these seals are to be opened in the last days. And at the opening of each seal, then there are certain prophetic events take place. Now, are the contents of the seals revealed immediately upon their opening? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, we turn to section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And here then, the Lord talks about the immediate events ushering in the millennial reign. And just for a point of clarification for those of you who are uh, students in these things and have delved into this, let me just say that the seven angels in the book of Revelation are not the same things as in the book of John, Revelation. Now, the seven angels in the, in, the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, are not the same as in the book of Revelation. Uh, if we have some time, I'd like to get into that. I don't know, but we better rush on. But John sees then these uh, seven angels that immediately sound now as the second coming is ushered in. And uh, then after they sound once, they turn around and they sound again. Now, they're correlated with Revelation. They're correlated, but it's not the same thing. And then here in section 88, page, or verse 108, he says, uh, And then shall the first angel again sound his trump. Now, this is another group of angels. It relates now to the events of the second coming, to what takes place. They sound... They get the events of the second coming in gear, and the second coming takes place, and then immediately after the second coming, then they blow their horns again. And note what it says. And then shall the first angel again sound his trump in the ears of all living, and reveal the secret acts of men and the mighty works of God in the first thousand years. Now here's when the contents of the sealed book are revealed. It's after Christ comes in his glory uh, and as a preparatory thing for that great task that the saints will perform when they judge the nations of the earth. And in order to ex exercise a righteous judgment at the beginning of the millennium, Zion will have been established, the millennial order, and the first item of business is to bring about a judgment of all men from Adam on down. And in order for that judgment to be made in righteousness, then that sealed book, the seals of which have been previously opened in the last days, that sealed book now has its contents revealed as this order of angels sound their trumps. And why so? So that the saints now who have the challenge of judging the world will have a basis an intelligent basis to fulfill that challenge and that responsibility. And he goes on and says, And then shall the second angel uh, sound his trump and reveal the secret acts of men and the thoughts and intents of their hearts and the mighty works of God in the second thousand years, and so on until the seventh shall sound his trump. Now let me just recapitulate a minute here. John sees a book. It has... Uh, uh, seven seals on the back, the contents under each of these seals is a revelatory record of the human family, including the secret thoughts of their hearts for the various 
successive thousand-year periods from the fall of Adam down to the opening of the seventh seal. You see that? That's what it contains. Now, as those seals are opened, then John sees prophetic events. The white horse represents something that's going to take place on earth when the first seal is opened. The red horse represents something that's going to take place on earth in the way of judgments, in the way of the cleansing of Zion, in the way of the cleansing of the earth when the second seal is opened. And so on down through. See, there's, and actually there's four horses. These are the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You see that? And uh, they represent then four major uh, eras of judgment leading up to the final cleansing of the earth. Now, before we get into the identity of each of these animals, let me turn to another statement by the Prophet Joseph Smith for some clarification. And I have reference now to section 87 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is called the Prophecy on War. So let's just say a few words about this, and then we'll come back to the book of Revelation and see if we can pick up the theme with the Prophet Joseph's clarification as a basis. Now, section 87 of the Doctrine and Covenants was given Christmas Day, December the 25th, 1832. And uh, many people, as they read this, say, hey, this is a prophecy of the Civil War. Now, let me back up and say, not quite so. Uh, this is too narrow a view. This is not merely a prophecy of the Civil War. Note, for example, the opening verse. Verily, thus saith the Lord, concerning the wars, and it's plural, it's not a war, concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come when war will be poured out upon all nations beginning at this place. All right, now what's the prophecy and war about? Let me give you the prophet Joseph Smith's own words on it. This is section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where a few years later then he comes back to this same subject and, and draws information and makes clarification uh, on uh, the prophecy and war. In verse 12 he says, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God, that the commencement of the difficulties which would cause much, much bloodshed previous to the coming of the Son of Man. Now, do you get the scope of things? It's not a prophecy about the Civil War. It's a prophecy about this era of judgment that we call the last days that will exist, transpire, take place previous to the coming of the Son of Man. He says, This a voice declared to me while I was praying earnestly on the subject, December 25th, 1832. What's the date of the prophecy on war now? December 25th, 1832, see? And uh, in that sense, then, he clarifies that the prophecy on war, then, is a statement of an overview of the judgments that will come that will finally lead up, as the prophecy says, to that time when the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations. Now, that's what it's talking about, you see. All right, now, within that scope of prophetic vision, let's take the prophecy in war just for a minute, and we'll carefully or quickly at least dissect it a little bit. We could talk all evening on it, but we don't have the time. We've only got 27 hours in this program, and we're running out. All right, so, so we, uh, we'll just briefly then dissect uh, this statement. Now, the prophecy then begins with a statement about the American Civil War, and it makes it clear that the American Civil War is the beginning of an era of warfare. Now, if you've studied uh, Arnold J. Toynbee's work on, on, uh, on history and so forth, and if you studied other military works then, in regard to the military program of the latter day, 
you'll find that they're all united in saying that the American Civil War is the beginning of that kind of war that we call total war. And it's also the beginning of mechanized war, where you have the first ironclad uh, ships. And it's also the beginning then of uh, uh, other kinds of things. Eli Whitney not only invented the, uh, the cotton gin, he invented mass production. And the North put that principle into operation and outproduced the South in, in economic goods and gained strength and power to overcome the South. So the American Civil War is literally the beginning of a whole new ball game of conflict. And that's what the Lord says here. He says, For behold, the southern states, verse 3, will be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain. Now this the southern states did, and Great Britain became involved in our internal affairs, and it cost them $15,500,000 in the Geneva Arbitration of 1870 when the thing was finally cleared up. See. Now, if I were doing this revelation, I'd put a new paragraph right there, because there's the beginning of a new idea. All right? It begins this new idea and says, and they, now the antecedent to they is Great Britain, and they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations. And then, not till then, not in the Civil War, but then, when Great Britain calls on other nations to form a coalition against other nations, and this was the Allied and the Associated Powers with Great Britain in 1909 calling upon other nations against the central powers of Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, etc., etc., then, then, he says, war shall be poured out upon all nations. Now, see, after the Civil War in America, then the next major conflict was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And that was an interesting war because prior to that, Germany had existed as just a whole multitude of independent states, weak by lack of organization. But this guy Bismarck came along with the idea of uniting the German states and establish them on the Prussian militaristic program of, of saber-rattling which he was successful in doing, and the, the catalyst that brought the German states together was the Franco-Prussian War, and he had prepared them beforehand by training them militarily and got some new modern weapons called a needle gun that was more efficient than anything that France had. And meanwhile, France was enjoying herself in all her dissipation with great national pride. And when Bismarck then provoked France then to declare war on Germany, and he did this with calculated intent. France accommodated him, and the new German nation trounced the socks off of them. And in Europe then, Germany emerged as the dominant nation of the earth, built on the cosmic system of military might and power of saber-rattling, and as a result of that, there began to develop a network of secret combinations in which one nation would say to another, if you are attacked by that nation, we commit ourselves to come into the conflict. And that system of secret alliances was built up gradually. And then in about the 1894 period of time, you see a tremendous thrust in Europe uh, in the arms race. And finally, in 1909, Great Britain called upon other nations to defend herself against these other nations. And by then, this secret network had divided the nations of Europe into two opposing camps. And when they were thus divided into two opposing camps, as all it took was a little incident for one nation to go to war against the other. And as a result, then one nation after another was dragged into that. For America, Wilson ran on the ticket of keeping us out of the war. But B. H. Roberts, an LDS scholar, in the summer of 8, 1914, wrote a little article which was published on the prophecy on war, in which he quotes this statement, when Great Britain calls upon other nations to defend herself against other nations, then war will be poured out upon nations, on all nations. And Brother Roberts then says, hey, they have called upon other nations, and uh, 
this incident now that is underway there is not going to be the end of it. One nation will be dragged into this after another until this becomes global in its impact. And so war was poured out upon all nations. Okay? Now that's the second thing. You first of all have the American scene. And then you have uh, the scene shift to, to uh, Great Britain. And then you have the scene shift from there. And note, it doesn't say much about World War I versus World War II or even include World War II. And the reason for that is that really it was just a little bit like the Jaredites. They didn't declare any peace. Shiz and Coriantumr just leaned on their swords and looked at each other until they got enough energy to swat each other again. And uh, the same kind of thing happened nationally. We were involved in another arms race before they ever got the ink on the armistice, and we used to call it Armistice Day. But then we saw the hypocrisy of it and we changed it to what? The Veterans Day. Why? Because there was no armistice. You see that? You're introducing an era of world war and world conflict. And then the prophecy and war goes on down. Now this is all related to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. Let me just put it this way. Revelation chapter 6, 1 Nephi chapter 14, and the DNC section 87 all deal with the same subject and the same prophetic picture. Now that's an important point. They all deal. Nephi sees it. He writes it in his manner, holding back, saying, I've seen it, uh, talking about wars being poured out and so forth. And uh, the book of Revelation then sees it. And now here, the prophecy on war. Now let's get the picture then from here, then we'll go back. Now uh, in verse 4, following now in sequence, it shall come to pass after many days. Many days after what? Well, you can take two possibilities. Many days after the rebellion of South Carolina. Or you can take the other alternative or choice. Many days after war has been poured out upon all nations. Now, if you study this out carefully, you'll find that the general tenor of thought is that this is in sequence. And so we're talking then about many days after world war uh, has plagued the world with the outbreak of war when Great Britain calls upon other nations to defend herself again. Now, many days after that, slaves shall rise against their masters, who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. Now, um, many days gets us clear on down through a ways, and slaves shall rise against their masters. I've seen articles written on the prophecy and war that try to bring the American slaves who joined the Civil War into the picture and have them fulfill this. Do that. That's wrenching the scriptures. That's taking them out of context. See, you've got to say, okay, we're going. We first have American Civil War, and then we have Great Britain calling on other nations in the era of World War. And then many days after that, then you have slaves rise against their masters, and their masters now are marshaled and disciplined for war. They're, they're a militaristic program, and slaves revolt against them. And then note in verse 5, and it should come to pass also. Now the word also extends the statement in verse 4 saying that the kind of thing you're talking about in verse 4 is going to take place in another setting with another group. Now, it should come to pass also that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves and become exceedingly angry and shall vex the Gentiles with the floor of vexation. Now, we know from the Book of Mormon what verse 5 is all about. We know what it is when the remnants who are left of the land, and they're the remnants then of Jacob on this land and so forth, and how they play Indian and cowboy instead of cowboy and Indian. Uh, and they do so with the Gentiles, and they go through among the Gentiles like a lion in the beasts of the forest and like a lung, young lion in the midst of, of a flock of sheep, see. And they are exceedingly angry, and they vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. Now, let's come down to our day. What is the great military power of the earth? that dominates in the sense of uh, uh, arbitrary power many, many people, which military power actually 
is marshaled and disciplined for war. Which one is it? Okay, you've got the picture there. It's the communist bloc and so forth, see. And who are the slaves? All right, they're those people who are under the dominance of that mighty military power. Isn't that clear? Okay. And they're going to rise against their masters. Now, when do they do that? Okay, you got it again. The whole beginning scenario is that the Gentile order in America here becomes violently turbulent, and uh, we're trying to save the Constitution as a batch of Latter-day Saints, and you have the rise of the strong man to stabilize things in America, and he doesn't think very much of Mormons, and you have a beginning era of warfare against Zion. And uh, this then is followed by the coming of the Assyrian to this land. And when the military power of the Assyrian, who is that great northern army spoken of in Joel chapter 2, of which Moroni gives some clarification, when that happens, then, uh, and the military might of that system is over here, if you were a freedom lover in Poland or in Hungary, what would you do? You will have mass uprisings. Slaves will rise against their masters, okay? And what will that cause? What kind of effect will that have? It will have this kind of effect. Those soldiers here will say, hey, we've got something closer to home we've got to take care of. And they will withdraw. And we then, with the power we can muster, and with the power of the Lord, keep in mind, as we discussed here the other evening, Isaiah says that the Assyrian will be driven back by the power of the anointing. And so it'll be a combined situation. And this land, which will have been disciplined and uh, will have been cleansed by that Assyrian, where the Lord says, I will send the Assyrian against a hypocritical nation, and he will cleanse and so forth. This land, then having been cleansed, will be left relatively free. Then what will happen? Well, the Indian people will be called by the Lord. They will band together. They will be exceedingly angry. They will vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. Meantime, what do the Latter-day Saints do? They get on the stick. The, the church has been humbled, and the church has been cleansed, and Zion has been refined. And the remnant that Isaiah talks about over and over and over again that the Book of Mormon just talks about. We discussed here uh, earlier in, in the Isaiah prophecy, see. Then uh, that remnant that has been cleansed and sanctified, this will be the group of people who then will redeem Jackson County. You see that? And they'll build up that order, and they'll save the Constitution, not in Washington, D.C., perpetuating the Gentile order. The times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. They were fulfilled in 1967. Jesus gives us a clue in, in Luke chapter, thir uh, chapter 21. He says, for example, there that Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, when did Jerusalem cease to be trodden down by the Gentiles? It began in 48 with the war there, and then there was this uh, six-day war in 67. At the time of that war, I was in Las Vegas, not for reasons that many Latter-day Saints go there, but uh, I was there on an education week, and I was discussing the last days. And you know, this building would have helped everyone who wanted to come because, hey, something's going on in Jerusalem. <laughs> And we had people filling here and sticking their heads in the door and listening outside and, and carrying messages on through to get to the, what I was saying to everybody who was congregated around. They thought Armageddon was on its way, and they were ready to repent. <laughs> and they says, Brother Andrews, is this Armageddon? I says, no, this is not Armageddon. I says, but I'll tell you what will happen. The Jews are going to come out on top on this. And I says, and I'll tell you what else will happen. They're going to get possession of Mount Moriah. Now, you go home and write that down. And so the Jews, after fighting for six days, they don't believe in doing a seven-day job, uh, 
mop the thing up. And they gained possession then not only of Jerusalem, of Mount Moriah, which is the core thing, and Jerusalem ceased to be trodden down of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles were officially fulfilled. Well, if I had time, I'd like to discuss that with you as to how it's the rationale, because we're still around, you see that. Now, there's reason for still being around, and I, I don't have time to get into that. You'll just have to take that one on faith. All right, and so he sees then in the book of Revelation, he sees then the American Civil War, he sees the, he sees the, uh, the coming of World War, he sees slaves rise against their masters, and he sees the latter-day remnant. And then he doesn't say anything more specifically, he just says this, and it should come to pass, and, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, and with famine and plague and earthquake and thunder of heaven and the fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of an almighty God until the consumption decree hath made a full end of all nations. He doesn't give any specific details more than that, see. All right, but those are enough. John, Revelation chapter 6 does the same thing. In John's chapter 6, overview of events in the last days. He mentions four things, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. And these four events are correlated with the prophecy on war. The white horse, for example, is America. And the one who sits on the white horse has a bow and goes forth conquering and to conquer. And uh, the white horse then uh, represents the beginning of the era of warfare against Zion. And in that sense then the figure of the bow is important, at least I feel so. And let me suggest it to you and you can think what you want to on it. We've had some interesting skirmishes in America recently. We had the thing called Grenada where they went in. We had the Libyan thing. We had the Persian Gulf then. And in each instance it is, as it were, we just sent a bow, bombed in, and pulled back. The white horse pulled back and unleashed a military action against a particular thing in this part of the area. See? And they did that in Granada, they did that in Libya, they did that in the Persian Gulf, and we just might have to do it some more, see? The white horse is doing his thing. The first seal has been opened. That's essentially what that would say, if that's right. You see that? All right, now, the red horse, then. What is the red horse? What does John say? John says in relation to the red horse, let me read it. That power was given him that sat upon it to take peace from the earth. And there was given unto him a great sword. This is a military power. Now, when the white horse gets through doing its thing, and the American economy, if we don't get some sanity in our head, goes under, and the latter day Assyrian comes to this hypocritical nation. Peace will be taken from the earth. Power was given him to take peace from the earth, and it was given unto him a great sword. Okay? Now, in the prophecy and war, after you deal then with the masters, you've got to deal with the slaves. The slaves who rise against their masters. And so John sees then, I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances. The slaves are interested in what? Justice. And they're also interested in sustenance. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil or the wine. And then he sees the fourth beast. And he opened the fourth seal. I heard the, the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked. And I beheld a pale horse, and the name that sat on him, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed after. And power was given to him over a fourth part of the earth. 
Now, North and South America constitute a fourth part of the earth. And the pale horse has to do with the remnant, and he's going to do something with pale faces, <coughs> if I can put it that way. And he that rode the pale horse is death. The remnant is becoming, they're going to become exceedingly angry. They're going to vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. And those whom they kill, being corrupt, instead of going to the paradise of God, will be thrust down to hell. And so he who sat on the pale horse is death, and hell followed after them. You see that? Now, let me just suggest that. You go home and pray about it and see what the Lord says to you. And then, on that basis, then, then the next seal is a focus on the martyrs. And these martyrs go clear back to Jesus and to the early saints and uh, to those that Bloody Mary took care of in uh, the 1500s, from 1553 to 1558, while she reigned in England, and others then and the Latter-day Saints who have given their lives. And they cry from under the altar, and they say, Hey, what's this business about not having any justice? You're a god of justice. And why don't you avenge us then of what's happened? And the Lord then will pacify them. They will be given robes of righteousness and blessed and consoled and told, look, before this is done, there are some other martyrs that have got to join you, and we'll just wait till all of you get together, and then we'll take care of it, see? All right? So that's the fifth seal. Now, the sixth seal, then, when it's opened, is the ordination of the second coming. Now, Christ does not come in the sixth seal or at the end of the sixth seal. We've got a bunch of literature out that has never really done their homework in relation, then, to the prophetic events. Let me turn, for example, to section 77 again, and let's go back and pick up this picture from the prophet Joseph Smith. He's talking now here about the events to take place as depicted in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Now, let me just fill you in beforehand. Revelation chapter 6 is an overview of the prophetic events of the last days, beginning then with the warfare against Zion, centering on the white horse, running it on through, and the sixth seal is the ordination of the second coming. And I emphasize the word ordination. Okay? Chapter 7 is a special spotlight scene, and we'll get to that after the break that deals now with the calling of the 144,000 great high priests of the Holy Order, whose mission it will be to gather people into the Church of the Firstborn, the sanctified Church, the Church prepared for the second coming of Christ. It's this Church that's going to be caught up to meet Christ, and the 144,000 have that ministry. And then they do their work. They do their work in a period of 21 months, 21 years plus. After the opening of the seventh seal, there's, there is silence in heaven, not on earth, in heaven, for the space of one half hour, or about, it says, one half hour. One half hour would put it uh, in the Lord's time, 21 years. About indicates it can be a little more than that, you see. And it's during that period of time when the heavens look on with awe and silence that the 144,000 go forth in the earth. Their plagues, their judgments, and their ministry is to bring people into the church of the firstborn. And then, immediately after that, the great cleansing plagues begin to take place. And there are seven of them. And they're spoken of in the 8th and the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. And let's read now what the prophet Joseph has to say about that. He says, When will uh, 
when are the things to be accomplished which are written in the ninth chapter of Revelation? Now, let's, the eighth chapter, he's, verse 12, mentioned in the eighth. Well, his answer then basically is this. He says, they are to be accomplished after the opening of the seventh seal before the coming of Christ. Now, is Christ going to come at the opening of the seventh seal in his great world appearance? And the answer is no. Why? Because these last great plagues and judgments that cleanse the wicked from the earth, and this is merely the parable of the wheat and the tares, the 144,000 gather the wheat. They gather them into the church of the firstborn. That's the bin. And they organize them according to the holy order as the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith in section 86 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then when they're gathered in and uh, the Lord comes to his temple and the great Adam on Diamond Council is held in connection with that great gathering and its co accomplishment, then the great plagues are poured out and the wicked are cleansed from the earth. And this is spoken of then in Revelation chapter 8 and Revelation chapter 9. You see that? And in that sense, then, the prophet says, these things are to be accomplished after the opening of the seventh seal, before the coming of Christ. So Christ doesn't come at the opening of the seventh seal. There's a half hour of silence, and then there's plagues, and that's under the sixth plague that the wicked are gathered to Jerusalem for the great abomination of desolation. And the last stage of that period of things is three and a half years. There's a longer, longer period that leads into it, but the last stage of it will be a three and a half year period of time. And then you'll have after it then the opening of the great seventh plague as Christ stands then on the Mount of Olives and the wicked are cleansed. But Christ doesn't come then until sometime way after the opening of the seventh seal. You see that? Now, when people put Adam on Diamond before the year 2000, they don't know the prophetic picture. When they put Christ coming to his temple before the year 2000, they don't know what they're doing. Now, we've got some literature out, and somehow someone got one to me somewhere that's uh, all geared up with those great events in the three and a half years now, somewhere in the 90s, and it's just a bunch of garbage. Leave it alone. Well, read it. If you can't separate the wheat and the chaff, go ahead and eat the chaff. <laughs> Okay, now, in that sense then, uh, let's just conclude here and then we'll take a little break. Uh, the book of Revelation, instead of one great chronological event, one after another, is actually a series of spotlights on the last days. John sees, for example, the four beasts and the elders. He sees the book, and that gives you orientation. He's seen the new heaven and the new earth. And then in Revelation chapter 6, he sees an overview. He sees the four beasts. He sees the wailings of the martyrs. And then he sees the second coming ordained under the sixth seal, but fulfilled in the seventh. It's like the, it's like the creation. Man was ordained to be placed on earth on the sixth day. He was placed on earth in actual fact on the seventh day. Go read, for example, the book of Abraham and the book of Moses. The book of Abraham in particular uh, makes it very, very clear that they came down to place man on earth. And then the sixth day terminates and the seventh day ordained. But man is ordained to be put on earth in the sixth day and is fulfilled in the seventh. Similarly, then you have the same kind of a situation. The second coming is ordained under the sixth seal, but it's fulfilled under the seventh seal. And then after that, then John sees this special spotlight of the 144,000. And then he sees chapter 8 and 9, which is the plagues. And then he sees chapter 10, which is a spotlight on himself, John the Revelator, with the little book that he's given, which is his ministry to gather the tribes of Israel. And then he sees another spotlight, and this is on the Jerusalem scene, the two prophets that are raised up in uh, uh, the period when the nations of the earth gather against Jerusalem in the great abomination of desolation. And then he sees chapter 12, and this is one of the most meaningful chapters. He sees the war in heaven, 
and it's a type and shadow of the warfare against Zion on earth. And we want to get to that, particularly from the inspired revision of the book of Revelation. And then he sees chapter 13, which is a portrayal of the two great beasts that make war, uh, Babylon and the Assyrian, or the little horn, or the northern army. You see that? Then he sees chapter 14. And chapter 14 then gives us the account of the angel flying through the midst of heaven to restore the gospel. And it seems like it's all out of kilter. I mean, after all, you've talked about the two prophets in chapter 11, and you've talked about the two great powers in chapter, in, in chapter 13, and then chapter 14 opens up, and you say that has to do with the restoration of the gospel. Clear back here before the book of Revelation even gets into gear to be fulfilled. You see that? Now, why? Well, you hold on to that one, and there's a real reason why, and it's a very beautiful one, and we'll get to it. But right now, let's take a breather. The Lord bless us to take advantage of this if you can. Thanks. In Revelation chapter 7, John spotlight concerning the choosing of the 144,000. Let's read what it says. And after these things, after he had seen these things, and the antecedent to these is the events depicted in chapter 6, which give you the overview of judgments in the last days. Under the figures of the white, the black, I mean the white, the red, the black, and the pale horse, and the other openings of the seals. Then he says, Now after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now, that just tells us that the earth is square, whether you believe that or not. <laughs> Got to do something to get life going. <laughs> you can make an argument for that. Some people have. <clears throat> Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel. Now, they saw, first of all, four angels. And then he says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth. Now these are four destroying angels, or at least their ministry at this time is one of destruction. So he says then, He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now let me turn to the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 321, where he deals with chapter 7 of the uh, book of Revelation, and just says briefly this. This is the report. It's a digest of his discourse. Four destroying angels holding power over the four quarters of the earth. That's a better translation. Until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies sealing the blessings upon their heads, meaning the new and everlasting covenant. And in this, he goes on to indicate bringing them into the church of the firstborn. Okay? Now, can you see this again? that clarification. You see four angels. They have power to destroy. Then you see a fifth angel. And this fifth angel ascends from the east, and as the four angels are about to do their thing, he says, hey, fellas, now you hang on. Don't get overzealous. <laughs> We've got a job to do before we reap down the earth, even though it's as corrupt as it is. And the thing we've got to do then is to seal the servants of God in their foreheads, which means sealing the blessings of the gospel and the house of the Lord upon them, see, and thereby organizing the church of the firstborn. Now, uh, let's go to section 77 again and pick up the picture here, as the prophet Joseph Smith uh, gives it to us. He says, for instance, and here's a very important clarification, verse uh, 
8. What are we to understand by the four angels spoken of in the seventh chapter and first verse of Revelation? And notice answered. We are to understand that they are four angels sent forth from God, to whom is given power over the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. Their powers are to seal to eternal life and to seal to the damnation of hell and to raise to life and to administer judgment unto death. All right, uh, over the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. These are they, now note this, these are they who have the everlasting gospel to commit to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, having power to shut up the heavens, to seal up unto life, or to cast down to the regions of darkness. Now, who are the four major angels that had and committed the everlasting gospel? Who were they? Keep in mind that John the Baptist, in restoring the preparatory gospel, merely acted under the direction of Peter. Peter restored the uh, everlasting gospel in the sense of its basic powers. Then you go to the Kirtland Temple, and in the Kirtland Temple you had three mighty angels, and they came and committed keys of authority by which the program and plan of the everlasting gospel is established. And those then were, first of all, Moses, gathering of Israel, leading the ten tribes, one of the great gospel angels. There's Elias, or Noah, who committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, reappointed the promises of Abraham, centered in them in Joseph and Oliver, and said in you and in your posterity now all nations of the earth will be blessed, and we give you these keys and these rights. And then Elijah came, and he restored the fullness of the holy priesthood and the sealing power as it relates to the house of the Lord. Okay? So that you have Peter, Moses, Elias, and Elijah, the four great gospel angels. And what is their power? Their power, then, is to seal up unto life or to cast down unto death. Now, in the beginning of this dispensation, we had the seed time, the planting time, the beginning time. And then the design is that the gospel be taught, and people are brought to the church. And then in the great cleansing of Zion, then you finally get a group of people raised to the level where you've got fullness of priesthood, and the blessings then that pertain to the house of the Lord and the endowment of glory, and the harvest period of the dispensation begins. And that harvest period is carried on essentially by the same angels that established it. They committed the gospel. They committed its power and its revelation and its taught. And then those four angels now holding power not only to seal unto life, but to thrust down to hell, are committed the responsibility of cleansing the earth. And they're the four great gospel angels. Note what is said now in the next verse. What are we to understand by the angel ascending from the east? Revelation 7, chapter and second verse. We are to understand that the angel ascending from the east is he to whom is given the seal of the living God over the twelve tribes of Israel, wherefore he crieth unto the four angels, having the everlasting gospel, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in our foreheads. And then the prophet adds, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. Now, this particular Elias is John the Revelator, and his ministry is depicted in the book of Revelation in the tenth chapter with the little book which he is instructed to eat, with the instruction that he would yet prophesy before kings and nations, and uh, he then, with the four great gospel angels then, 
are in charge of this great harvest season. Under their authority, the 144,000 will be called, and they will minister. Now, who are the 144,000? Let me read now further in section 77. When or what time are the things spoken of this chapter to be fulfilled? Now, this sealing of them. Let's get to that first. They are to be accomplished in the six thousand years or the opening of the sixth seal during that period of time. Sometime between now and the opening of the seventh seal, there's going to be a calling of 144,000. And uh, they will be prepared. They will be great high priests. Note what the Lord says about it. Uh, what are we to understand by sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel? 12,000 out of every tribe. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order. Now, these aren't high priests, say, for example, like I'm a high priest. I'm a high priest in the ecclesiastical order. I have the temporary job of a member of the high council of the Alpine stake of Zion. That high priest office then is in the ecclesiastical order. These high priests are the kind of high priests that Abraham wanted to become. Read chapter 1 of Abraham, where he sought for his appointment, and he became a high priest, holding the rights belonging to the Father. And this order of priesthood came down from the beginning. It was conferred upon me by the Father, see. And it came down and it pertains to God's appointment to the fathers concerning their seed, you see. Now, a high priest of the holy order is one, first of all, who has received fullness of priesthood in the house of the Lord, where it's given and where only it is given. And it's given as a joint ordinance. And in that sense, then, the sisters are involved and will be involved in that great ministry. All right, so it's a joint ordinance, and it's conferred in the house of the Lord. And one who is a high priest, then, is one who has received that fullness of priesthood and then presides in that order. He has the right to do it. He has the right to administer fullness of priesthood. And he has a right to preside in the holy order of God on that plane and level of the Zion society. All right, now, with that clarification... What are we to understand by the sealing of the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel? And keep in mind, 12,000 out of every tribe. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom it is given power over the nations, and those angels are the four gospel angels and the apostle John, who ascends from the east and says, hang on, brethren, we've got a work to do first. I've got a special mission which Christ gave me, for which I was a translated being and am a translated being, and this is depicted in the little book. And his ministry now is to bring Israel to God. Okay? And so he says, then, these high priests then are ordained and uh, by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. Now, this is not a missionary crew. They will preach the gospel. They will do that, yes. But their primary objective then is to take those who have received the gospel and been sanctified and bring them into the church of the firstborn by and through the the sealing powers of the holy priesthood and the fullness of the priesthood given in the house of the Lord. And that's the way you build the church of the firstborn. And it's that church that's going to be caught up to meet Christ in his coming in glory. And so, as a part of this great harvest season, the book of Revelation now deals with the harvest. The restoration of the gospel, that's history. The coming of Peter, James, and John, that's history. The coming of Moses, Elias, and Elijah, that's history. And we have administered and taught the gospel, and we go on through, and then the time comes when John sees these major events. And so with that, let's go 
back now to Revelation chapter 7. And in this particular revelation, then, let's read what he says. He saw four angels standing on the four corners, or parts, or quarters, rather, of the earth, holding the four winds, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel, and that other angel now was John, the fifth angel, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was, was given to hurt the earth, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And this is the sealing powers of the priesthood. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, a clarification or two. You've got to gather enough of the tribes to have a basis to do that. The return of the ten tribes will come before the selection of 144,000. That's simple. The return of the ten tribes will come before the opening of the seventh seal. That's simple. Now, there will also be those from Judah who will be thus sealed. There wasn't everyone in Judah wasn't participating in the crucifixion of Christ. For example, on the day of Pentecost, uh, which was a holiday, a celebration, glorious day. There were people gathered to Jerusalem, Jewish people from all nations. And uh, on that sacred day, the power and gifts of the gospel were poured out, cloven tongues of fire rested upon the elders in a sacred endowment. And those who heard it then says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gave them the standard program of the gospel. He says, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promise is unto you and to your children, to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. All right, so they gave them that program. They weren't under condemnation. But if you read the third chapter of the book of Acts, where he's talking about the people who were responsible, he says, I would that you hadn't done this. And then he administers a different program of redemption for them. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. He didn't say anything about baptism. They weren't worthy of it. They were in a situation where they had sinned grievously against great light and truth, crucifying the Messiah himself. And so he gave them the only formula of redemption he could give them, and that was to go to hell and pay the debt in a repentant state and then come forth and receive some kind of a, of a redemption. So he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. The times of refreshing are when the earth is renewed to its paradisical state. If they would repent and be converted, their sins would be blotted out, not in baptism, but when the times of refreshing shall come, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. See? Now, there were Jews then who were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ and who were under condemnation. There were others who were not. And I suspect uh, in these mighty events, while the Jewish nation as a nation is not redeemed until the final end of things, that there will be those of the sons of Judah who will participate in many of these things. See, There will be those of the sons of Judah who do. But you will have then, before the opening of the seventh seal, the calling out and giving the sacred rites and appointments of high priests within the holy order and over the holy order to a body of men of 144,000 from every tribe of Israel. Now, we are from Ephraim, and Ephraim will be called out and elected first, I presume, because he's the birthright tribe. And uh, you'll get some then from Joseph and from the Indian people. And when the ten tribes come and they will return in a body, the prophet Joseph said that so clear there should be no issue on the matter. He gave us that knowledge with such certainty that there should be absolutely no issue on that matter. And they will return as a body, and they'll have prophets in their midst. And like we said this afternoon, they will come to Zion and be crowned with glory. And from among that body, that body of Israel, then many of the 144,000 will be called, because they will be on that plane and that level of things, see. Now let me just make this clarification. The prophet Joseph Smith makes it clear that the 144,000 began to be called out as early as Kirtland. And there were some of the faithful brethren in Kirtland who were given that promise that they would be part of that number. 
The 144,000 will include not just mortal people, but translated people and even some resurrected people. And John the Revelator, who is, uh, who is a translated being with Peter and with Moses and with Elias and with Moses, I mean with Elijah, will preside over that great work. And this is the harvest. This is the gathering of the wheat. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And you gather the wheat into the church of the firstborn. And when that's done, and it's done then through this sacred ministry, then, then you have the time then for the cleansing of the earth, see. Then these four angels who restored the gospel and who have power to seal to life and to exaltation and also power to seal to damnation and to hell, then they will preside over this great cleansing period of time in the earth, see. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's about the great harvest season of this earth and about the ushering into the millennial period and the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of the earth and eventually then the celestialization of the earth as an abode for the righteous. And it's just that simple. It's just that simple, see. Now he talks then about the 144,000 and then he goes on and says, and beheld great multitudes which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples. It's one thing to be the work crew, the 144,000 who do this. And these are high priests. And there'll be others, another thing then, to receive the benefits and blessings and to receive fullness of priesthood and prepared and made members of the church of the firstborn. And this will be a great multitude, uh, he says, uh, uh, here indicated, having clothes uh, clothed with robes of righteousness and palms in their hands and so forth, see. All right, so much for chapter 7. It's this, it's this spotlight then on this great and important function of preparing a people for the second coming of the Lord. This great harvest season presided over then by the great angels of the gospel with the apostle Paul, with the apostle John, who came up to that sacred uh, level then of authority within the holy priesthood of this earth because of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's John the Beloved. And by his love, then, he received that appointment. And by his choice, then, to remain and be a translated being, he's given the promise that he will prophesy before nations and before kingdoms. And in that sense, then, that will be fulfilled, that promise, in this period of time when he goes forth with the 144,000 performing this sacred sealing work. All right, then, in chapter 8, it begins by saying, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour. Now that's the Lord's time. One day of the Lord is a thousand years for us. You compute that out. And a half hour is about 21 years of time. And when he says about half an hour, and he's not talking exactly half an hour, but about. And I suspect then it may be a few months over that, say 21 years, 10 months, or something like that, see? And in that sense, then, there's silence there. And it's during that period of silence in heaven that this great task force goes forth. These are those who fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 16. I will send for fishers, and then I'll send for hunters. And they'll hunt them out of every hole and every crevice in the rock, see? The great 144,000. They're really the ones who teach the gospel and administer its power and who seal up those who reject it to the damnation of hell. Read section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants where power is given to those then who bear the message of the gospel to seal up to the damnation of hell those who reject this message. Now, the missionaries may go forth with some measure of that power, but its fullness is exercised by the 144,000. And when they get through, when they get through, note then what John says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and, and to them were given seven trumpets. And now here you're preparing now for the, for the great cleansing of the earth. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar uh, which were before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and so forth came up. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And the seven angels 
which had the seven trumps prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned, and so forth. And so you go through those great plagues of the last time. Well, let me just clarify. Those plagues are spoken of in two places in the book of Revelation, chapters 8 and 9. And then John comes around and gives a different slant to them in chapters 15 and 16. Okay? Now, for the sake of time, let me rush on. Now, chapter 10, then, is a special spotlight on John the Revelator. And uh, it speaks of him then. He says, I saw a mighty angel stand upon the earth and to lift up his hand to the heaven. This mighty angel is Michael the archangel. And he swear by him that live forever and ever, who created heaven and things thereon, and the earth, the things therein, and so forth, that there should be time no more. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and this is a period of time that we're dealing with, he says, when he shall begin to sound his, his, the mystery, and there's an extended period, that horn rather continues on, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And he, as he hath declared it to his servants, the prophets. And then he uh, says this, And I went unto the angel, and, and he said, uh, And he said unto me, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but as it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now let me turn again to section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants. For the prophet now is dealing with this, the question is asked, for example, uh, what are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation? Well, hey, I need to get that. I'm, I'm a little out of kilter here. Let me let me just mention that. We'll come back to that. Let's go to... Uh, uh, Verse 14, what do we understand by the little book which was eaten by John, as mentioned in the 10th chapter of Revelation? We are to understand that it was a mission and an ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel before, behold, this is Elias, who, as it is written, must come to restore all things. Now, Elias is one who presides over the holy order, see? And he has the mission, then, of restoring uh, all Israel. But we've left out a point here that's vital and important. We need to come back, and so let me do that at this time. Now, in verse 12, let's get another clarification. What are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the eighth chapter of Revelation? These seven trumpets of cleansing and so forth, see. He says, weird understand, and note how he puts this that as God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified it, the world, and also formed man out of the dust of the earth. Now, what is he saying? The first six days of creation he organized the physical orb. What did he do on the seventh day? He finished it, and he sanctified it. He brought it into full paradisical glory. And what else did he do? All right. In addition to that, then, he says he also then formed man out of the dust of the earth. Man is ordained under the sixth day, fulfilled under the seventh. Now, and he uses that as an illustration. Note how he words it. We are to understand that as God made the world, we're going to use this now to illustrate something else. As God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified and also formed man out of the dust of the earth, even so, in the beginning of the seventh thousand years, will the Lord God sanctify the earth. There is a likeness between creation and cleansing. He will sanctify the earth and complete the salvation of man. Now, what does that mean to complete the salvation of man? That means give the righteous fullness, bring them into the house of the Lord, endow them with glory, and all of that, see. 
All right, and judge all things, and shall redeem all things, except that which he hath not put into his power, when he shall have sealed all things to the end of all things, ought to be capitalized. Why? Who is the end of all things? Who is the beginning and the end? It's Christ. And so you seal all things to the end of all things. And the sounding of the trumpets of the seven angels are the preparing and finishing of this work, of his work, in the beginning of the seven thousand years. You see that? After the opening of the seventh seal, the beginning of it, the preparing, he says, of the way before the time of his coming. So Christ does not come at the opening of the seventh seal. You have the half hour silence, and then you have the judgments, and all this designed to do what? To sanctify the earth, to complete the salvation of man. This is the harvest season. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares, to bring them into the church of the firstborn, give them full blessings of exaltation. And all this then in the 7,000 years. Now, we should have put that one in. Now, going from there then to Revelation 10, John has a special ministry on that, you see. John has a special ministry. And that special ministry is depicted in a little book that's given to him. And he's told to eat it. And it has some interesting uh, tastes in relation to it, which are referred to there. But it symbolizes the mission that he is given now, and for this then he was translated, one reason for it, to bring the house of Israel to the Lord. Okay? Now that's chapter 10. Now what's chapter 11 about? Well, chapter 11 then deals with these two prophets. Coming back to this afternoon's discussion, where we indicated the second coming of Christ is actually a series of events, that he comes first of all to Zion. And that appearance to Zion then, uh, actually there will be multiple appearances. The Book of Mormon twice, once in, in uh, 3 Nephi 20 and the other in 3 Nephi 21, talks about Christ coming to Zion. And he indicates that when the new Jerusalem is built and the power of God descends upon them, then he makes this statement, verse 25 of 3 Nephi 21, Then shall the power of, God, of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in the midst. Now, he said that before in 3 Nephi 20, see. And so uh, it's in this period of time when Zion is cleansed and after the opening of the seventh seal, that Christ then comes and dwells with his saints. Technically, this is the beginning of the millennium. And among the saints among whom he then lives, they will have the blessings of Christ's appearance. You see that? They will have him coming to them in this period of time. And uh, so in a way, then Christ does come somewhere around the opening of the seventh seal. Somehow, but he doesn't come to the world. He will come then to the faithful Latter-day Saints who have been cleansed and keep in time between now and then. The righteous remnant has got to be cleansed and uh, prepared, and the new Jerusalem has got to be established. And then Christ will come, just like Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 59 and you need to read verse 19 as well as 20. 19 refers to the warfare against Zion. And then chapter or verse 20 refers to Christ coming to, to Zion uh, in the last days. Let me read it. Verse 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Now that's the great and abominable church gathering multitudes to make war against Zion. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What does Nephi see happens when, when the enemy comes in against the saints? The power of God in great glory rests upon him. And then in the next verse he says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. Remember also we read that statement from Moroni? 
Moroni's visit to Joseph Smith on the hill Camorra, where he says then that the saints will be persecuted until they finally receive an inheritance where the glory of the Lord rests upon them. And when this takes place, he says, then the ten tribes were revealed in the north country. And then he says, and when this takes place, then will be fulfilled the words of Isaiah, the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to those then who turn from ungodliness in Jacob. See? And so Christ will come to faithful Latter-day Saints very near to the time of the opening of the seventh seal. Now, how far is that in the future? I'll leave that for you and to work out, see. And in that sense, then, uh, it comes in that respect to, uh, uh, to them. And uh, uh, then, as the 144,000 do their work and bring people into the church of the firstborn, and they're sanctified, and they're given those higher priesthood blessings in the house of the Lord when it's d this is done, and when their work is done, then Christ will come suddenly to his temple. Now, the word suddenly didn't mean suddenly after Malachi's day. It means suddenly after that work is done. And Christ will then come to his temple. And as we pointed out this afternoon, I think it was, I, I'm getting in the blaze and maze on what I've talked about, uh, we will find then that his coming to put the capstone on is to make them kings and priests in actual fact, see. Now, they've got to be brought into the church of the firstborn. They've got to be given fullness of priesthood and the promises and guarantees relating to that. See, they've got to be given those things. And then Christ comes to his temple and puts the capstone on. And that will take place after the ministry of the 144,000. And then after that, you'll have the great council of Adam on Diamon. And why is it after he's coming to his temple? This is easily understood when you understood the Council of Adam on Diamon. There's a great judgment held. People who have keys of priesthood in past ages stand in judgment for what they've done. Uh, but not only is that the case then, not only is that the case, but having been judged for their, their stewardships in past ages, then they scratch their heads a little bit and say, you know, we had a glorious time. Moses will say, we had a glorious time at Mount Sinai, but I never did get those people to believe very much. And then, then they never really built the holy order in their midst. And we never built that up and put the capstone on. And so our dispensation is incomplete. There are many people who didn't even really get the gospel. And so our dispensation is really incomplete. And then Peter will come along to Joseph in that council and say, you know, we had a great time. I had marvelous powers given to me. I healed the sick and all of that kind of thing. And we had great things given to us. But you know, we never built the holy order and put the capstone on. We didn't do that. We didn't get our dispensation completed. And the same will be true of all the other prophets. Even Enoch will say that. Because as good as he was in his day, he did not get Zion built to the point that they put the capstone on before the great council of Adam on Diamond, which Adam held three years previous to his death. There were many of them who had come up to that, but not all. And so they will have to wait to the second great, great Adam on Diamond council. And when this is held, Joseph will say, well, you know, we have got the capstone put on ours. It's completed. And I'll tell you what I think we can do. If you, brethren, will be sealed to me so that you come into and become part of the dispensation of the fullness of times, and this is when we really make the dispensation of the fullness of times. Some people think that because we've got a restoration of all keys from past dispensations that we got the dispensation of the fullness of times. That is not true. That's only foundation. The next thing that's necessary is to build Zion and put the capstone on and then you've got to go to Adam on Diamond, and then you've got to seal the other dispensations into and under the canopy of this dispensation, and that makes the dispensation of the fullness of dispensations. And it's just like the prophet said here in 168 of the, of the teachings where he says, for example, now again God has purposed in himself that there should not be an eternal fullness until every dispensation should be fulfilled and gathered together in one. 
until you've got to gather all past dispensations into this dispensation. And when you do, it makes the dispensation of the fullness of dispensations. Or another way of saying it is the dispensation of the fullness of times. The word dispensation and times being synonymous. Okay? Now, where is that done? That's done at Adam on down. And can you fulfill all things and gather them to a fullness if the capstone hasn't been put on? Zion. If Zion hasn't indeed been made an order of kings and of priests and queens and priestesses, and the capstone has been put on, see? Now, this has to be done then before the great council of Adam on Diamond, and it has to take place after the ministry of the 144,000. And when the ministry of 144,000 is over, then the great prophecy of, the, of Malachi will be fulfilled where the Lord will come suddenly to his temple, see? After that, then the great Daniel vision of Daniel 7, where he sees the Ancient of Days uh, come, and the great Adam on Diamond Council. And there's the judgment that's set, and then you begin to look around and say, how and how are we going to prepare people for the second coming? The prophet here in the teachings, page 157, deals with that, and he uh, expresses it this way. He says, uh, Daniel in the seventh chapter speaks of the Ancient of Days. He means the oldest man, our father Adam, Michael. He will call his children together and hold a council with them, and note this now, to prepare them for the coming of the Son of God. Now, how does he prepare them? Well, he prepares them, as the prophet Joseph says in relation to the book of Revelation, where you seal all things to the end of all things. You see that? You seal all things to the end of all things. You seal all things to Christ. And how do you seal all things to Christ? You start out and you seal all things to Joseph first, just like the scriptures indicate. Then this whole order of things, you have a program where the first is last and the last is first. Note, for example, where the Lord says here in section 29, verse 30, and remember that all in all my judgments that are given, and the man, and as the words have gone forth out of my mouth, even so shall they be fulfilled, that the first shall be last, and that the last shall be first in all things whatsoever I have created by the word of my power, which is the power of my spirit. And then turn over to, you, to Matthew 19, where the Savior is talking to his disciples, and the apostle Peter, little impetuous, uh, looks at his life of persecution and his following the Savior and wonders what he's going to get out of it. And I guess that's a legitimate wonder. And he expresses that. And he says, uh, uh, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall for we have therefore? What, what shall we have therefore? And then the Savior tells him, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then the judgment isn't that you're rewarded to be a bishop in the celestial kingdom, or a stake president in the celestial kingdom, or one of the brethren, like lots of people want to be in the celestial kingdom, see? Rather, instead, he says, and everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. In other words, you perfect the holy order, the family order, and a man then may have uh, a family relationship over his physical posterity, and he may be a father spiritually like Abraham over others, and those who have forsaken the Lord, the, the world and followed the Lord will be given a hundredfold of fathers and mothers and so forth because they have a presidency within the holy order. And then note what he says in the next verse. He says, but many that are first shall be last in this judgment of things, and the last shall be first. Now, who's the last dispensation? Who presides over it? Who's going to put the capstone on finally? And when he gets the capstone on, and the holy order is built, completed, and you go to Adam on Diamond and you visit around with Peter, and Peter says, hey, we didn't do it. Then Joseph says, hey, I got a way. I know a way to do that. You be sealed to me and come into my dispensation, become part of it, and we've still got people working around on earth doing temple work, and we'll have your people's work done for them, see? 
And so Peter's dispensation is brought to a completion in the fullness in Joseph. And Moses says the same thing, and the Jaredites say the same thing, and the Nephites say the same thing. And Enoch comes up a little bit shy, great and glorious he is, and says, you know, we did pretty good, but we didn't quite cut it, Brother Joseph. And Joseph says, that's fine, you come on in too. You see that? And the last becomes first. And all dispensations are gathered into the dispensation of the fullness of times, to make the dispensation of the fullness of times. And this is done at Adam on Diamond, see? Now, when this takes place, then you're ready to go to, the, to Jerusalem. The Jewish people haven't yet as a nation been brought in. And so you're ready to go in the great prophetic timetable to Jerusalem. And so John sees then in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation these two prophets who are sent to Jerusalem during the period of the abomination of desolation in the last days. He sees that, and he sees their ministry, and he sees the power of the spirit that they have. And this is a day of power, see? And they have that spiritual power with them. And uh, meantime, there has been gathered to, to uh, Jerusalem many Jewish converts, and there is a Jewish church made up of Jewish converts, the covenant people of the Lord that Nephi saw, Nephi saw, on whom the power of God in great glory rested as well as upon the Latter-day Saints. And they flee to Jerusalem, and by their faith, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of the story because all of them don't stay there, but those who stay support by their faith these two prophets. It takes power of faith to perform the works of righteousness that they perform. And they hold in abeyance these uh, uh, great forces that gather against Jerusalem, the heathen forces, uh, the Assyrian and Babylon, the two combine together as they go against Jerusalem. And as they do then, finally, though, these, these forces overrun the city. And these two prophets then are killed and lie in the street. And as they are killed and lie in the street for a period of time, the Revelation says this, uh, uh, and that their dead bodies lie in the street for three days and a half, and shall not be suffered their, their dead bodies to be put into graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. You'll get the media going there, and everyone will be happy that those two guys have finally been taken care of, see. And, uh, so they, they send gifts back and forth to each other, and they get all ready now. They celebrate before they're going to go in now to mop up the Jewish people. All right, but just about that point, Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, which is after three days and a half the spirit of life came, of, of spirit of life from God entered into them. When Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, that signals the resurrection of the righteous. And uh, with that great cataclysmic upheaval, taking place, the graves of the righteous will be opened. What happens to those two prophets who are laying in the streets? Well, they get resurrected too. And it says, for example, uh, they heard a voice came in, coming, saying, Coming up hither, and as they ascended into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God. And so forth. See, now these events then center in Jerusalem. Now, how about Revelation chapter 12? Another special spotlight which is vital to us to understand. Let me, though, in order to get to it, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 12 in the Prophet Joseph Smith's inspired revision of the Bible. You can't get this from the King James Version, you have to get it from the Prophet's inspired revision. And uh, let, me, let me make a clarification to begin with, and then we'll get to it. Whenever the Lord ordains an earth to be created and inhabited or populated, along with that ordination is the ordination that there will be two great centers of power. One will be called Jerusalem, and the other will be called Mount Zion. And the Jerusalem and the Mount Zion that we have on this earth to be built on this earth, then, are patterns of an eternal plan. The prophet Joseph Smith, for example, makes this comment in the teachings, page 12. He says, A man may be saved after the judgment in the terrestrial kingdom 
or in the celestial kingdom. But he can never see the celestial kingdom of God without being born of water into the Spirit. Now note he's added comment. He may receive a glory like unto the moon or like the stars, he says, but he can never come to Mount Zion. He's talking about getting your head above the veil and, and back there. Mount Zion is up there, really. The Mount Zion on here is merely the funneling down of knowledge and truth and the building of an order of things that approximates that one up there. Now, he's talking about the blessings of the second comforter. He can never come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's two, see, Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, for example, let me give you a reference here from 3 Nephi 20. And this is another reason why, when you study the Book of Mormon, read every word and then read those words backwards, if it has to, and upside down and over and crossways, because every word becomes important at points. Now, in 3 Nephi 20, he's talking about the great judgments that are associated with and finally consummate in the building of the new Jerusalem on this earth and the sanctification of Jerusalem in Palestine and the establishment then of the great world order of millennial righteousness where the law goes forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he says this now in verse 36. And then shall be brought to pass that which is written. And he quotes Isaiah here, but he adds something to him. Then shall that which is brought to pass come to, pa well, come to pass which is written, Awake, awake again. The word again is not in Isaiah. Jesus put it in. Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For thenceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. Now you ask yourself this question. Whenever before in this mortal period of time, from the days of Adam down, have we had Zion and Jerusalem rise to become universal powers in the earth? When did that happen the first time? In the latter day when it happens, it's going to be the second time it happened. Awake, awake again. Do it over again. Do it over again, the second time. You see that? Awake, awake again, and put on strength. When did it happen the first time that Zion arose in power and Jerusalem to become a universal order, a millennial system? When did it happen? Well, it didn't. And it's not talking about the first time being in mortality. And that's the thing I want you to see now. And that's what Revelation chapter 12 was all about. The war in heaven is a prototype of the warfare against Zion on earth. Now, we've said before earlier that the general pattern of warfare against Zion has two main divisions or two main thrusts or attacks. One, then, is the warfare against Zion in America and the elements of Zion throughout the world by the multitudes from of the abominable church that gather against them. Now, they don't overrun us. They cleanse us. They do us good. and. Uh, kick us in the dust and bat us over the head with a four before, and they do a lot of other things, but they merely cleanse the righteous and sanctify them, and out of that whole difficulty you establish the New Jerusalem, see. And uh, then after we've established the New Jerusalem in that purpose, then he knows, he knows there can't be an eternal fullness unless the two cities are established in righteousness and power. And he knows that if he can thwart the work of the Lord in at Jerusalem, he can in some measure gain a tactical advantage and prevent the Lord from reigning in full glory and power. And so he then shifts his gears, and all nations are gathered against Jerusalem. There's, there's three great gatherings spoken of, for example. Here in the teachings, page 231, the prophet puts it this way. There are three great gatherings. The saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation. The Jews will be gathered together in one. And the wicked will also be gathered together to be destroyed, as spoken of by the prophet. 
Well, John the Revelator does. Joel does. Isaiah does. They speak of the gathering to Jerusalem to be destroyed. You see that? And so when Lucifer can't achieve his purposes in relation to Zion, he gathers all nations against Jerusalem in, in, in a, a great zealous attack against the Jewish people. And he would succeed, too, except Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives. Now, that great scenario had a pre-earth, a pre-earth original design. The war in heaven in the first estate was a warfare against Zion. And that's what Revelation chapter 12 was all about. It's a war, and the warfare there followed the same pattern. It was made against Zion, the holy city, which held under the bombardment. And then he shifted to Jerusalem. Now, with that introduction, let me read chapter 12. John puts it this way. And there appeared a great sign in heaven. Now, this is the inspired revision, and it doesn't say all of this in the King James. And there appeared a great sign in heaven in the likeness of things on the earth. So what he sees in pre-earth life is a likeness of what he has seen in the book of Revelation in the warfare against Zion there on earth, see. Okay? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and the woman being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, that's political power. And her child, now we're talking about pre-earth life, we're not doing anything here on this earth yet, her child was caught up into God and his throne. Now, that's a scene that took place in the spirit world in the first estate. Now, what do those symbols mean? Let me read on. And there appeared another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Satan is symbolized under that sign, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, those seven heads and ten horns represent Babylon. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 13 and others, and they, these are the symbols that represent Babylon. And what he's saying here is that there was Babylon in, in the first estate. It wasn't just a quarrel over free agency. You don't become perdition by that. And you don't follow Lucifer with his appeal because you're just a righteous person who doesn't really think that uh, you want to risk it and ready to get a little agency. You follow Satan because you have become corrupted and you've become Babylon. And you know darn well that intrinsically the character of your being is such if you go to mortality under the power of the fall that you're not going to make it. And so you are ready to bargain away your free agency and, a, and take and buy the plan of some guy who says, hey, you give me your agency and I'll get you all back. You see that? All right, so there was a Babylon in pre-earth life, and there appeared another sign. Now, this is in heaven, and it's also in likeness of things on the earth. There appeared another sign, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail do a third part of the stars of heaven. Don't hassle on that point. It was a part, not a fraction. And he says, did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. Now, this is still talking about scenes in pre-earth life. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was delivered, ready to devour her child after it was born. Now, that's a kind of a gruesome thing. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Now, the King James Version says days, a thousand three hundred and threescore days. Joseph changed it to years. I'll just note that, and we'll come back to it. And there was war in heaven. Now, this is the war in heaven. This is the pre-earth scene. Now, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought against Michael. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman 
which was the church of God. Now we've got the meaning of one of those symbols. The woman is, is a representative of what? The church of God. Where? In the first estate. And she brought forth a man-child. And that man-child then was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Alvarez read on. The dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Now, the day will come when the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will have to give birth to the government of God. It won't be given birth to by the Gentiles or by the heathens. It will be faithful Latter-day Saints who have built a foundation of free and open union and who sustain the Constitution and who give birth to the government of God. And this will be after the pattern of pre-earth life. Now, what John is saying is this. He sees a, a sign in heaven in the likeness of things on earth. And what he sees there now is the war in heaven. And in the war in heaven then, he sees a woman. And this woman now is the church. It's the pre-earth church in the first estate. And she had on her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman was with child. And she cried to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. She brought forth the government of God in the first estate. But Lucifer was there, ready to devour it. And so the woman then fled into the wilderness. Now, the term fleeing into the wilderness has more than one expression. DNC section 5 talks about the church uh, coming forth out of the wilderness in modern times, 1830. And so people try and apply that to that. But note, Joseph Smith said that she fled into the wilderness for a period of 1,000, uh, 1,260 years. Okay? If the restoration of the gospel, if that's talking about that there, what is 1,260 years minus 1830? Which would be when the church went into the wilderness, right? If you, take, if you call that the apostasy. Well, it would come out the year 570 A.D., which would mean that there was no apostasy from Christendom until 570 A.D. or better than 250 years after the Nicene Council. Now, does that apply then? Is that what it's talking about? Is that talking about the, the Christian apostasy? And the answer is no. It's talking about the warfare in heaven. And in the warfare in heaven, then, Lucifer unleashed his power against Zion, and she stood. And the church gave birth to a child. But as that was born, it was caught up into heaven. And he turned his power then against this woman. And she drove, was driven into the wilderness for a period of 1,260 years. And uh, in other words, the woman, the church at Jerusalem, fled. She fled to Zion. There strengthened her powers, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, and they finally mustered enough power in Zion to go back to Jerusalem. And when they did, note what happens. He says, neither, uh, he says, the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Neither was there place found in heaven for the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice then in heaven saying, Now is come salvation, and the strength, and the power. Now is come salvation, and the strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, for they have been, for they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the powers of Christ and his infinite atonement. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony unto death, and so forth. And so when the woman then was driven into the wilderness for a thousand two hundred and sixty years, and the war in heaven took place, they mustered the power necessary, and they threw the rascal out. And that's how Satan got cast out of heaven. They established God's kingdom, 
this man child that was born to rule all nations in the spirit world with the rod of iron, and under that righteous rule with Zion established and purified, then they threw the devil out. And then he heard a voice saying, Now is come salvation and the strength and the power of our God and the kingdom of Christ. Now that was the episode of the war in heaven. John sees it as a sign in heaven in the likeness of things that are to take place on earth. Now on earth you're going to do the same scene. And in the latter days then, as this scenario begins, when the Lord then selects those to come to earth, when he really wants to establish his Zion, he then takes those who stood the test of fire against them in the warfare in heaven, in the warfare against Zion. And he appoints many of them to come to earth in the last days who have backbone enough to stand up and be men and women and who have integrity enough to receive the gospel and apply it and to meet the onslaught of persecution and of insinuating accusations and to finally move on under the warfare against Zion and establish Zion. And then when that happens, then in the latter days the scene will shift now to Jerusalem. And that's what the rest of the chapter 12 was all about. And he sees then the, sh the, the scene shift to Jerusalem. And as it shifts to Jerusalem, there's a church there in Jerusalem. And let me read now what he says. And he says, And after these things I heard another voice saying, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, yea, and they who dwell upon the isles of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that his, he hath but a short time. For when the dragon saw that he was cast out into the earth after this warfare in heaven, and they threw the rascal out, then he persecuted the woman which was, had brought forth the man-child. So he comes around and persecutes the church here on earth, who is going to bring forth the government of God and establish the millennial kingdom. See, He says, Therefore to the woman were given two wings. And here he's talking about the church in Jerusalem, if you'll let, permit a, a clarification. He says, Therefore to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, and she, that she might flee into the wilderness, into her place, for she was nourished for a time and times and dividing of times. Now, what does that mean? A time, times, and dividing of times. Well, it's just another way of saying 1,260 days. And these 1,260 days are patterned after the 1,260 years of the warfare against Zion when the concentration was against Zion. Jerusalem before they finally massed power and threw him out. Now, know what John says. He says, Therefore the woman was given two wings, the great eagle, she might flee into the wilderness for a time, times, and half time, and so forth. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as the flood after the woman. He is the great prince of the power of the air, and he controls the elements. And as the remnants of the Jewish church, many of them fled when the abomination of desolation got underway, then the adversary then endeavors to destroy them through the natural forces that he has control over. And uh, he sent forth a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Therefore the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war against the remnant of her seed, which rest there in, in Jerusalem, which kept the commandments of the Lord and have the testimony of Jesus. And then the finishing of the story is that as those people flee then to Mount Zion, others then stay. And that's an interesting choice you have to make. Here's the abomination of desolation getting underway. You understand the prophetic picture. You know that this is going to be the cleansing and the redemption of Jerusalem, and you're one of the Jewish saints who's gathered to Jerusalem. And you see the armies come, and you know also that it's necessary to gear up your soul and generate spiritual power in order to get victory. And it isn't just enough to stay there and hang in, that you've got to do something for your native land on the basis of faith and the sealing powers and the powers of Zion. And so there are those then who flee from Zion. I mean from Jerusalem and go to Mount Zion. And they will go there for 1,260 days. 
which is patterned after the original. And there will be others then who remain there, and by their faith they'll sustain the two prophets. And their alternative is this. If we get killed, the resurrection comes on us right quick. Meantime, we love our Jerusalem. We love Jerusalem. These are the events when the Jewish nation are going to be converted in a day. We want to be here. We want by our faith to sustain this. And so they do that, and they stay there, and Lucifer makes war against them. Now, meantime, what's going on in Zion? We're endeavoring to gear ourselves with power now to do that final thing. Take that rascal and throw him out the second time. We want to do that, and so we're gearing spiritual power, and those Jewish saints come, and we do that. And then in the great events of Zion, the Council of, uh, of Adam on Dial and so forth, the judgment is set and things are ready for the second coming. And then the Savior takes a group of people from Mount Zion. He says, come on, boys, it's time now to go to Jerusalem. We have now got the faith to develop among these people necessary to do the job. And so he takes a group of people of the saints. Heber C. Kimball said he was going to be there anyway and others, and he takes them and they go and stand on the Mount of Olives just at the nick of time. And they overthrow the forces of darkness, and uh, they sanctify the Jews, they cleanse Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple, and they sanctify it, and they administer the ordinances of the temple, and they give fullness of priesthood to the, to the Jewish people. And they prepare them by bringing them into the church of the firstborn. And all of this now is preparatory work. They've stopped the forces and the powers there by Christ coming to the Mount of Olives. And they then do this. And when they have done that and the Jewish people now are brought into the church of the firstborn, then Christ comes in his glory. Then those who are righteous on earth are caught up to meet him the resurrection of the righteous having previously taken place, just as Paul says, that, that uh, we which are alive shall not prevent those which are dead, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. See, Now, in that sense, then, you have that great scenario. And what John sees is the war in heaven in pre-earth life as a type and shadow of the warfare against Zion of which the book of Revelation is all about, which is dealing with. Do you see that? And that great cleansing program that comes against Zion and finally consummates in Jerusalem and ends up with establishing the millennial reign and throwing the rascal out and having an era of peace and righteousness, just like they did in the war in heaven. Now that is what it's all about. And that's why Isaiah says, as quoted by the Savior, awake, awake again. Let's do it again now, boys. Awake, awake again. Put on righteousness, see. And in this sense, bring these two great poles of power back then on this earth into being to usher in a millennial era on this earth of righteousness and peace, just like the glory and power of God was made manifest in the spirit world when they finally threw the devil out. Now, all right, now I've got to hurry. I've got about two minutes, and I want to get through to chapter 14. We talked about chapter 13 the other day. It merely talks about the two powers, Babylon and the little horn. Now, as I worked this thing through and studied it out and pondered and prayed on it, I had a great big question. Why did the Lord wait till the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation to talk about the restoration of the gospel? Why did he? Why did he do that? After all, in sequence of things, He's talked about, for example, this, this Revelation chapter 7, 144,000, and that's way after the restoration of the gospel. He's talked about Revelation chapter 8 and 9, the great judgments, that's still further after it. He's talked about the Jerusalem scene. He's talked about the, uh, the warfare in heaven being a likeness of the warfare on earth. He's talked about that. He's also talked about the, the two powers that are together, and then we say that he saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Now, why wait till then? Well, again, the Book of Mormon gives you the key. Now, in Nephi's great vision, he sees this warfare against Zion. 
He sees the cleansing of Zion. He uses the Isaiah prophecies to tell us plainly about us. God is going to cleanse this people, and God is going to cleanse this land. And he tells us that very, very plainly. And then he tells us about this great work that is going to go forth to such an, to such an extent <coughs> that people will either be polarized on one side of the issue or on the other. And there will be a great division that takes place. And Nephi then sees that and talks about it in 2 Nephi chapter 30, which among everything else we've talked about so far, we haven't yet got to. And he says this, For the time speedily cometh, verse 10, that the Lord shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked will be he destroy, and he will spare his people, Yea, even if so, but he hath must destroy the wicked by fire. Now, he's just giving you a generalized statement, comment, out of having seen the same thing that John the Revelator saw. Now, on that basis, then what's Revelation chapter 14 about? Well, it's about the great division. And he's taught and shown that that great division is produced by the restoration of the gospel. But he begins, as Revelation 14 opens up, and I'll get to the King James Version on that just as well, uh, he begins then with his description of the righteous in that great division. And uh, he has this to say about it here in chapter 14, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Now this is Zion established now finally upon her mount in glory and power, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the harps, the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000. They have a unique and distinct position with the Lord. They are they in the holy order who are sealed immediately and directly to him, just like the Lord promised the twelve in Luke chapter 20. Ye are they then who will eat at my same table. They are sealed in the holy order directly, and they have a role then that's unique and distinct. And so he sees then Christ stand upon Mount Zion, and he sees then the 144,000, and he's taught that they're a distinct body. And he says, These are they which are not defiled by women, for they are virgins. And some people think they're all a bunch of bachelors. And they've never heard the story of the ten virgins, and that includes men and women. The word virgin here merely means sanctified one. And they're they who have fullness of priesthood. And you don't give fullness of priesthood except to a man and a woman combined together jointly, do you? And so they're all good married guys. Believe me that, brethren and sisters. They're all good married folk. But they're called virgins because of their purity. And he says, And they are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. He has, they have that relationship. These are redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. They stand at the first fruits, eat at the same table, are sealed in the holy order immediately to Christ. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, in order to bring this about, this great division where he sees Mount Zion and the 144,000 on it, then he sees that the means of bringing this about would be the restoration of the gospel in the last days. And so he says now in verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And then there followed another angel after this. Now the great division is underway and taken place, and it's been brought about by the restoration of the gospel and the proclaiming of this gospel by the angel to all the earth. And then there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, 
the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture upon the, uh, into the cup of in his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And uh, he goes on to talk about it. And then, having seen this great division and, and the predicted fall of judgment of Babylon, then he sees the harvest season. Now note what he says. Verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, thus saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Here's Christ. Having on his head a crown of gold, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat upon the cloud, Thrust thy sickle and reap. See, this is the harvest. For the time is coming to reap, for thee to reap, for the harvest is ripe, of the earth is ripe. And he that sat upon the crown thrust his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now this is the gathering of the wheat. This is the gathering. You see the great division. You see that division is produced by the restoration of the gospel, by the angel flying through the midst of heaven. Then you see the proclamation that Zion, that, that Babylon is, is fallen. And then in this whole scenario, you see, first of all, that Christ then thrusts in his sickle and he reaps the righteous and gathers them in. And then in verse 17, another angel came out from the temple which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle, and John is seeing now beyond the veil. And another angel come out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now this gathering here is the gathering of the wicked to Jerusalem to be destroyed. And he says, And the angel thrust in his sickle in the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And that's Jerusalem. And he says, And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came from the wine press even unto a horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There will be that much blood shed in the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is just between Jerusalem, the Mount Moriah, and the Mount of Olives. It will run bridle deep because of the slaughter that takes place there. All right, now this then is the great division. The great division produced by the restoration of the gospel. The great division seen by John when he sees the 144,000 stand on Mount Zion. And he sees that they're a select group, and he sees that they sing a new song, and he sees that they're sealed directly and directly related to, to the Christ. And then, then he shifts and sees now how this is all brought about. The angel flying through the midst of heaven, and then after that, Babylon is said to fall. And then he finally sees specifically the gathering of the righteous and the gathering of the wicked. And in the gathering of the wicked, they're gathered to Jerusalem to be destroyed. And in that destruction, the destruction is so devastating and so gruesome that blood runs to the, to the bridle of the horse's bit, see. That's how it is, see. All right, now in that sense then, then he sees chapter 15 and 16, which is a review then of the, of the plagues. Chapter 17 is a depicting of the woman Babylon under the symbol of a great woman, scarlet, with uh, the words Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth written on her. Chapter 18 then and 19 gets you into the second coming of Christ. Chapter 20 is the John, the Revelator's great vision of the millennial period, where Satan then is taken and bound for a thousand years. And after the thousand years is over, then he's loosed, and the great judgment takes place, the resurrection of, the, of all men, both both uh, small and great, and they stand before God in the final great judgment. And when that is taken, uh, portrayed, then he sees chapter 21, the new heaven and the new earth. And this is the new celestial heaven and the new earth, and he talks about it, see. And so the book of Revelation deals with what? Well, it deals with fulfilling this great objective of making this earth a celestial orb. It deals with the great gathering of the righteous in the latter days, the harvest season, the harvest season where, where you gather the righteous into 
the church of the firstborn, and where the wicked are gathered together finally to Jerusalem to be destroyed. See, it sees that marvelous thing. It's the plainest book, one of the plainest books God ever caused to be written. It's as easy to understand as the alley-oop comic strip if you'll read it in the right context, see. Now, may the Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters. It's been a thrill to be with you. I feel that he's given us strength. When I got here the other day, I felt like I was just about half sick and ready with a real throat problem, and I asked the Lord to help me on this one, and I believe he has. I believe he has. I just want you to know that I know that the gospel is true. I know that Jesus is the Christ with an absolute knowledge. I know that this is his work. I know that the greatest responsibility of a Latter-day Saint is to yield obedience to the living prophet and join with him hand in hand in the program that he's inaugurated, and that goes to with his state president and his bishop. You can't build Zion on your own. You can only build Zion under the mantle of authority that's given your bishop and your state president. And so please, brothers and sisters, unite, get away from the cliques, get away from the special hobby situations, get the vision of Zion, get on fire to get your home teaching done with the Spirit of the Lord in your life, get your welfare programs, be generous in your consecration, live the temple covenants, joined together with a oneness that comes from the Spirit of the Lord and a love that's born of the love of Christ and the power of His Spirit in your life. And let's build Zion. I bear you my testimony that God does live and this is His work and that Ezra Taft Benson is His prophet and that your respective state presidents are called of God and have the mantle of God. I've never seen one that didn't when I've talked with them. And let's take that and act on it. And then let's get this great vision of things. You know, the Book of Mormon is a miracle. When you think of all of this stuff put in there in clarification in one working day period, working period of 75 days or less, producing a document that does all this, and I haven't even got started yet. I haven't. I've run out of time. I haven't got started yet, hardly. See, and all of this then comes in the Book of Mormon, and there's a lot more. And how Joseph Smith got that all packed in there and put in proper perspective, and so find a way with so precise a language that opens up the vision of things. How did he do that? Expect by infinite intelligence and knowledge. How could he do that? See, He was a prophet of God. If there's ever been a prophet of God, it was him. He was a greater prophet than Moses, a greater seer than Samuel. He had a more uh, dramatic rise out of humble, more humble circumstances than Abraham Lincoln. And he, and not Emerson, is our wisest American, and he's our prophet, and I love him. I love to hear his voice, the Spirit bearing weapons of him. I have studied him all my life. I know that he was a prophet of God, and I know this work is true. I carry that testimony in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Do you want to have closing prayer, and then we'll answer the questions of any of the one to stay? I penned in these words, which are really inadequate, but it was the best I could do at the moment, to Brother and Sister Hiram Andrews in deep appreciation for the great Book of Mormon seminar that you blessed us with in the Snowflake State. Thanks for sharing uh, <laughs> with us your deep well of knowledge and wisdom, signed President Flake of the Snowflake State. Thank you. We'd like to make this presentation to you. Thank you, President. wants to know you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We just deeply appreciate this. Thank you. you won't get a lot of scripture out of it, but you'll <laughs> see a lot of good, faithful people. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, this has been a tremendous and a great seminar. Our vision has been enlarged. We have seen a great table of delicious food placed before us that we have the right to work for and strive to get. Uh, now we go back into the cold, cruel world and do what we have to do in order to get it. He's tantalized us 
with these great blessings. It's been a great seminar, but you know, I haven't learned any new doctrine. Most of you here can probably say the same. I've had the doctrines that I've known enlarged upon and embellished upon and much more information given, but it's the same doctrine we hear year after year and day after day from our great apostles and prophets and those people of the mantle of authority. I know now that it's the job to get back down in the trenches and to do those things that he's told us told us to do, those fulfill those jobs that we have in the church, to do our home teaching, to do our visiting teaching, to more importantly than anything else take care of our families, to go home and teach our children the principles of the gospel, and to live celestially in our families and improve our lives to gain a special relationship with the Savior and with our Heavenly Father that we might be able to reap the blessings that we've been talked about and to talk to about and and then to play a part in this great work that's to be done. This is there for us if we'll do what we can to play a part. Now much has been said about the greatness of this seminar, and it is great, but we also have this opportunity at twice again each year as we listen to General Conference and hear our apostles and prophets. And where this seminar is so great is I think each one of us who have listened and learned can better understand what the brethren are telling us. You know, almost every major scripture that we went to through these 27 hours, I've had that underlined, and I've got them through listening to the brethren. I haven't put it together this well, but through this seminar, now we can more fully understand what the brethren are trying to tell us, more fully understand this great plan that is ours. I thank from the bottom of my heart, Brother and Sister Andrews, for sharing their wisdom and their understanding with us so that we can more fully understand the scriptures and understand the brethren as they talk to us. And I bear to you my testimony that the gospel is true. I know it with every fiber of my being. I thank each of you for the great people you are. I, great, I thank you neighboring stakes for coming and sharing this experience with us. I'd like to, to uh, give a great vote of thanks, and I hope you'll join with us for this great committee, Sanford and Louise and the great committee that, that did this. Those who can give a great vote of thanks for Brother and Sister Andrews and the committee, show it with the uplifted hand. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I bear to you my testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel, and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.